Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the lecture series in bioenergy. So, when we concluded the last class, we concluded with the formation of uh, fructose 6-phosphate which is the first key molecule or a sugar molecule and uh, I concluded with the fact that uh, in the next class we will talk about how the two major molecules called the starch or the sucrose are formed. Because these two formation of these two molecules is essential about what is the raw material we are getting to transform these kind of energy rich molecule to alcohol or whatever other energy rich products. So, the efficiency or the growth or with what rate these molecules are formed and what is the energy requirement for a plant to produce per unit starch or sucrose or, or all these energy rich molecules is what determines that how much benefits we can harness from a biofuel or from the whole process. Will it be cheaper? Because think of for a minute, we went through, so we started the class with the energy dynamics, we talked about the basic energy and then we moved on to the bioenergy. Then we moved to the bioresource where from there on we started talking about the whole scheme of biomass production. And in that process we have explored the light and dark cycle of photosynthesis. And in the dark cycle by the time we read the last class we talked about the Kelvin cycle where the formation of sugar takes place. So now this in this whole process of thing you need solar energy which leads to excitation of the chlorophyll molecules at photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, then that generates very strong reductants like NADPH and weak as well as uh, weak oxidant as well as weak reductant like ATP as well as oxygen as a byproduct. Okay. And in that process we realized that this whole thing what all input in terms of the solar energy, in terms of ATP, in terms of NADPH and how much carbon dioxide is getting transformed. So, there has to be a kind of a energy map that what is your input, what is your output and what is the cost involved. Because whenever we are growing plant, now to add up few other things, suppose you are growing a plot or acres or hectares of land with some plant which you believe that you can transform it into, you can transform the biomass of it into some kind of a very, very rich biofuel. So, what you have to take into account is, for example, so what you have to take account is that particular plant, what is certain things which you are getting free of cost out here the input wise your free of cost input is sunlight provided you are staying in a sunlight rich area. But then water it is a commodity there are places on earth where it is cheaper yet there are places on earth where it varies. Then you need in terms of growing the plant or the crop slash crop putting. Okay. I am just putting energy rich energy plant or energy crops. Then you need uh, fertilizers and nutrients, fertilizers and nutrients. Now, even with the sunlight, there may be a situation you may do may have to do it indoor. So, you need different kind of setup in terms of say if you have to use artificial light okay, as well as 
So, after this you need to spend on plant protection measures in terms of attack from pathogen and other microbes. After all these things what is the output what you are getting is in the form of a biomass. So, these are your of course, if you are growing it in someone else's land then you have to give the soil or the land charges. So, if you odd, add all these things say for example, A if I represent it by A or A prime if it is an artificial light source B which is water C which is soil and land then D this expenditure and of course, for then you have the E, then there is an involvement of manual or machine labor in terms of how big is the farm size. So, that is your F, okay. So, these are all your expenses. So, if I have to put the expenses, so these are your expenses expenses include A or slash A prime plus B plus C which is soil and land plus D plus E which is plant protection measure then you have the F at least. Now, what you are producing is biomass what is the form of biomass you are getting that is what we are going to discuss today either it will be starch or some form of uh, other simple carbohydrates uh, like uh, <coughs> sucrose. Okay. Now, comes the next phase of it which is transforming them. So, either at this stage you have two options either you can directly use them for burning fuel okay, or you convert them into high end fuel. So, before we move into this part how you will be conversion which will be the next part which will be taking probably after a couple of classes. At this stage we will talk about what is the currency of biomass in form of in terms of the starch and the sucrose if you see the last class where we ended this is where we stay. So, the fructose to starch and the sugar and in that process what is the expenditure of ATP, ADP and the light. So, today our job will be at this stage we will talk about we will not so we will talk about what is the light expenditure you needed, how much light you will be needing for this kind of situation, how many photons, water we are not dealing fertilizers and nutrients is crop to crop basis we are not going to deal with this soil and land also we are not dealing. We will definitely talk about the how many water molecules on an average you will be needing to make 1 hexose or 1 6 sugar, 6 carbon sugar and plant protection measures we are not taking here because that, that also varies from plant to plant and this is also we are not taking. So, essentially what we will be dealing today we will be talk about what is the water expenses what you are having what is the light in terms of the photons and in this process what all ATP and NADPH is involved to convert CO2 to 6 carbon starch or sucrose. Okay. So, let us move on. So, if we talk about the starch and the sucrose, so a starch is nothing but those of you just recollect back when we explain about uh, the structure about the glucose. So, you can represent glucose something like this okay. it is a 6 carbon. So, something like this it is a monosaccharide. Okay. So, now these glucose molecules if this is an individual glucose I am not adding all the functional groups or anything out here. So, if each one of these glucose molecules here G represent glucose, okay, each one of these glucose molecules are attached to each other like this. 
in linear chain. So, there are two ways it can join. One is called say for example, it is linearly attached like this something like this which is called 1, 4 glycosidic linkage. Okay. This is one of the ways how this linkage takes place which is a linear linear chain long linear chains of molecules. Yet there is another way it can form that forms between two different chains say for example, this is if I represent this as one single chain like this and there is another chain like this and between the two chains there are linkages which are called 1, 6 glycosidic linkages. So, what does that 1 and 4 means is, so if you start numbering them, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Similarly, here if I number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, if you see the bond which is forming here, it is forming between carbon 1 and carbon 4. That is what represent 1 of this one for the first one, this one and the 4 of the second one, this one. Okay. So, that means that makes it 1, 4 glycosidic because both of them are glucose molecule glycosidic linkage. So, say for example, there is a bond which forms between say for example, let me again write 2 glucose molecule say this is 1 glucose molecule sitting here and let us number them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So, another glucose molecule somewhere out here with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, if there is a bond which is formed between this one and this one, then those are called 1, 6 glycosidic linkages. So, if we look at what we are essentially doing plant contains two major storage forms which we have already talked about one is the starch and the other one is the sucrose. Okay. Now, if we talk about the starch, starch is basically stored in the form of starch is like glycogen it is very similar to or rather starch is similar to glycogen and it is basically you can call this as a polymer of glucose and most of this polymeric chain of sucrose consists of 1, 4 glycosidic linkages and there is a small fraction, small fraction of 1, 6 glycosidic linkages which are present in them. So, this is synthesized and stored in the chloroplast. So, all this is starch molecule what you see. So, this the genesis of all these things is from fructose 6 phosphate. to starch Kelvin cycle fructose 6 phosphate look at this molecule. So, this is converted into starch or and sucrose. This is starch is stored in the chloroplast. Now, there is a second molecule which is formed which is called sucrose. Sucrose is a much more simpler molecule. It consists of two units, two six carbon chain, six carbon rings. Okay. So, we will talk about how this sucrose molecule is formed and it is readily usable sugar. Okay. Coming back to the slide. So, you have this fructose 6 phosphate. So, if you see the structure of the fructose 6 phosphate, now let us start from there. So, fructose 6 phosphate is something like this, it is a 5 
carbon chain. So, you have the oxygen out here, you have hydrogen here which is the fifth carbon and you have the sixth carbon out here CH2 O PO3 2 minus this is the phosphate group this is the sixth carbon okay and you have your o hydroxyl group and this is your fourth carbon. Now, you are on the third carbon hydroxyl group pointing out of the plane and here you have hydroxyl group and you have another hydroxyl group attached to this carbon which is the carbon 1. So, this is your fructose 6 phosphate. Fructose 6 phosphate is using an abundant phosphate translocator. So, you needed a phosphate translocator. The phosphate translocator I am adding now phosphate translocator. So, this phosphate translocator is a molecule like this and this phosphate translocators are fairly rich in the chloroplast. Okay. There is oxygen out here. out here, then you have O C O sorry O C H 2 H. So, another 5 member ring out here which is O H H H O H and Okay, there is a nitrogen CH, CH with O, I have the NH here, sorry, this is NH, and you have the O, and this is called your, let me just finish this molecule. There is oxygen out here, you have hydrogen and you have a hydrogen and OH, OH, H and HOH. Okay. So, this is called that phosphate translocator, it is called uridine, there is a uridine group attached, diphosphate glucose. This is also called UDP. So, you have the diphosphate out here, diphosphate glucose and there is a uridine attached to it. So, when this two molecules react with each other in the presence of sucrose 6 phosphate synthetase, sucrose 6 phosphate synthetase is the enzyme which is involved in it what you essentially get out of it is uh, sucrose 6 phosphate. So, sucrose 6 phosphate is nothing but this molecule, this what you see, the fructose and you have this part which is the glucose. So, what you are, so you have glucose and you have a fructose which makes you the sucrose, sucrose 6 phosphate. So, you have the phosphate group like that which comes as it is. So, if you see the structure, structure will be like this. Let me just draw the structure. And of course, you will be left with the UDP which is the uridine diphosphate, I am not drawing that again. So, it will be something like this, Chin O and here you have OH, CH2, it is 
So I'll leave for you guys to complete this whole structure. I wish you to complete this part of the structure, okay? That's kind of your assignment to look at how these things are formed. <clears throat> so just now what we concluded is in this whole process, we landed up with long chain starch, which consists mostly of 1,4 glycosidic linkages and few or handful of 1,6 glycosidic linkages. These are long chain. Apart from it, we what we get is sucrose molecule, a 1,5 carbon ring of and 1,6 carbon ring of glucose and a fructose. They attach together and form what we call as sucrose. So these two are the major molecules. So now coming back to our first slide of today. So these two molecules, what we talked about is what will dictate that what is the efficiency of this process. But before we get into the efficiency, now let's take a account of how much NADP and NADPH has been involved in this process. So coming back to the NADP and NADPH. Okay? So if you remember, we started the reaction like this, CO2 plus H2O forming CH2O and plus oxygen. This is the first reaction what we started when we said carbon dioxide is getting reduced to carbohydrates, okay? Whereas water is getting a split into proton, electron and oxygen. You have protons, protons, electrons and oxygen. Now, in this process we realized, so if you go back to the cycle, we saw there are involvement of ATPs out here. There are two ATPs which got involved and there is another ATP which got, so the first two ATP which got involved was when 3-phosphoglycerate is converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. You have two NADPH making NADP and you have another ATP molecule converted to ADP by donating that phosphorus group in the conversion of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or ribulose 5 phosphate to ribulose 1, 5 bis phosphate. So ribulose 5 phosphate has a single phosphate and 1, 5 bis phosphate is having two phosphate moieties. Okay. So if you see, so in one cycle, there is two ATP plus one, three ATP, right? So this is one ATP, two here and one here. So two plus one, three ATP are involved. Whereas if you see at the NADPH, there are two NADPH are consumed. Okay. So now let's add up this to the cycle. So we talked about 3 ATP plus 2 NADPH. So this is what is needed to convert one CO2 molecule to add one CO2 molecule. So for 6, you will be needing 6 times of this. So essentially what will happen? 3 ATP for 1 carbon. So or rather 1 for 1 carbon you need 3 ATP. So for 6 carbon you will be needing 3 multiplied by 6 ATP. So which is essentially 18 ATP molecule will be needed. Similarly, if this is one, the other instance is NADPH, okay? So for attaching one carbon, you need two NADPH. 
So attaching 6 carbon you will be needing 2 multiplied by 6 12 NADPH. Okay. Now this is what we are going to add into this equation what we have put forward in the beginning to start our journey of photosynthesis. Now we are revising the reaction you have CO2 which is a single carbon. So now we make it 6 now I am adding 6 CO2 because we need 6 carbon sugar plus we have talked about 18 ATP plus you will be needing this 2 H2O so you will be needing 12 water molecules one point of time plus we have talked about you will be needing 12 Na DPH okay and what you are getting out of it is C6 okay 6 carbon H12 O6 plus it has donated 18 phosphorus moieties so we are left with 18 ADP diphosphate here you have the triphosphate just compare okay plus 18 phosphorus molecule which has come, come out from tri to die, die okay plus 12 NADP plus because it has donated these hydrogen to out here which makes it H12. So, this is that critical reduction process what we have been talking all along or this reaction essentially okay plus we talked about there will be a proton 6 H plus are those protons which are left. So, what we see out here if we see what is the energy expenditure of synthesizing a hexose. So, if you go through a 6 rounds of Kelvin cycle this is what you expect. So, this is the sum total of the energy expenditure of a 6 round of Kelvin cycle when you go through it this is what you will obtain. Okay. Now, I will add 2 3 more things before I conclude this part is what is the efficiency of photosynthesis how it is being ev evaluated. Okay. So, if you have to see the efficiency uh, because this will be very relevant to our next topic where we will be talking about the C3 and the C4 plants and how the Rubisco's oxygenase activity is being countered in high temperature where because of the high temperature the photorespiration increases. So, the delta G the first thing is the delta G 0 prime for the reduction of CO2 to hexose which is a 6 carbon is plus 114 kilocalorie per mole. Step 1 second. So, the reduction of NADP to NADPH NADP plus this reduction process is 2 electron process. Okay. Hence, the formation of 2 NADPH requires the pumping of. So, if you want 2 NADPH molecules to be formed. So, this requires this this part is very critical just evaluate it carefully. This requires pumping of 4 photon to photosystem 1. So, 4 photon to photosystem 1. So, this is the light expenditure we are talking about. The electron given up by photosystem 1. So, it is giving out electrons in that process is being replenished by photosystem 2. Now, photosystem 2 replenished those electrons which are given out which needs to absorb equal number of photon. 
So, automatically this also need equal number of photon into play. Hence, some total of photons which are needed is if you add these two, what you are getting is you will be needing 8 photon. This is the energy expenditure in terms of the photons. So, what you are getting is hence 8 photons are needed to generate the required NADPH molecule. Okay. The proton gradient generated in producing 2 NADPH is more than sufficient to drive the synthesis of. So, in that process there is a proton gradient synthesis of 3 ATP molecule. So, mark my word again the proton gradient generated in producing 2 NADPH is more than sufficient to drive the synthesis of 3 ATP molecule. And the third and the final aspect is that a mole of 600 nanometer photon has an energy content of 47.6 kilocalorie. So, remember this part a mole of 600 nanometer once again 600 nanometer photons has an energy of 47.6 kilocalorie and so the energy input of 8 moles so the energy input of 8 moles of photon will be equal to 381 kilocalorie why 8 moles from where this 8 mole is coming so if you go little further up see the 4 photon and 4 photon 8 so, this is from where this 8 moles of photon needs 381 kilocalorie. Thus, this brings us to the concluding part of this lecture. Thus, the overall efficiency of photosynthesis under standard condition is 381, which is approximately 30 percent. So, from where 114 is coming, 114 is coming, this 381 you know from where it is coming, 381 is coming from here and 114 is coming from here, the delta G of conversion. So, when you divide 114 by 381 multiplied by 100, so efficiency of photosynthesis on the floor of earth is 30 percent. So, this is how the whole energy dynamics. So, if you look at look in the first slide what I showed you in the beginning of the class to start off with. So, this is we talked about the formation of the starch and the sucrose right followed by we talked about the ATP and NADPH and the whole expenses of course, barring aside we did not talk about this one, we did not talk about this one we did not talk about this one, we did not talk about this one. What we talked about is the water, sunlight which is involved in the form of photons and the energy needed to convert this reaction CO2 to 6 carbon. And what we are getting out here is, let me come back. Okay. So, so the take home message for you people is this part, a mole of this much amount of light which is 380 kilocalorie, which is 381 kilocalorie, what is needed to convert 1 hexose molecule which is 114 and if divided by that what you are getting is we are talking about. 30 percent efficiency. So, overall photosynthesis is 30 percent efficient. Now, from here keeping this in mind and talk keeping in mind the problems Rubisco faces, it has oxygenase as well as carboxylase activity and there is always a tug of war. There is a very interesting thing as the temperature increases especially arid semi arid tropics of the world where the temperature is fairly high. In those places, the 
oxygen binding capacity of rubisco increases so in other words photorespiration increases you are consuming oxygen how the plant get around it because this is very important because if you remember the very first lectures what i was giving you i told you that if we have to get a huge biomass we have to ensure it is not the cost of environment because if, you, if the system itself is consuming a lot of oxygen it is not going to help us so what nature has developed this will take us to one of the very very unknown study made by one russian followed by an australian scientist hatch and slack and uh, how they discovered something called c4 plants from here we will move on to stuff since now you know the efficiency overall efficiency which is 30 percent we have talked about the drawbacks of rubisco and have also talked about why a lot of mutagenesis studies of you know manipulating the rubisco molecule as of now is not really successful because rubisco is a peculiar enzyme sitting out there so what nature has devised to ensure that rubisco's efficiency is maintained at high temperature where otherwise rubisco will behave more for photorespiration than for utilizing the carbon dioxide so we'll close in here we'll resume our next class where we will talk about c3 and c4 plant and that will kind of bring us to the point how all these bio first set of biofuels are formed by nature and from there we will take up how the conversion is going to take place and what are the basic paradigm how these starch sugar cellulose bunch of glycans and everything which are formed how to convert them and how much energy has to be consumed to convert them as of now we have talked about how much energy is needed to make them by nature itself next phase we will talk about once we are done with the c3 c4 we will talk about how much energy man has to put to convert this to much more usable fuels so this is how the whole bioenergy landscape will run through where we have a fairly good idea or a grip on the system about what is happening in nature in the form of photosynthesis photorespiration rubisco light reaction dark reaction formation of uh, starch and sugar molecules and from there we will move up how we can convert them once we harvest all that okay thank you